Please turn to the book of Daniel once again. We are in Daniel chapter 8. And once again, we'll read the entire chapter. Daniel 8. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns. And both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth, without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power, Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the greater horn was broken, and instead of it there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it, together with the regular burnt offering, because of the transgression. And it will throw to the ground, or it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, and the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation." but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. And he shall be broken but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. 
but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, once again we find ourselves in uh, strange territory, uh, dealing with Uh, goats and rams and cities and places and times and kings that uh, are part of history that are uh, foreign to us in pretty much every way. And yet, Lord, uh, this chapter is recorded in Scripture for our benefit. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would hear the words that were given to Daniel, that we would hear them as they were meant to be understood, that we would hear them in such a way that we can take their message And live it out day to day uh, beyond this morning. Lord, we ask that you would mold us and shape us in the image of Jesus Christ. For your glory. Amen. Uh, Have you ever noticed how many uh, preachers and writers and teachers read apocalyptic literature like the second half of Daniel and the book of Revolution? uh, Revolution. Uh, Revelation. It's going to be that kind of morning. I apologize already. And they conclude from it that the end is near. Uh, This, of course, is not a new trend, especially in North America, in fact, almost exclusively in North America. Many Christian teachers and preachers have, have been identifying world powers and world leaders as Babylon and the Antichrist and the Beast, and they've been setting dates for the end of the world for a very, very long time. In fact, if you go to just about any bookstore, if you do any kind of search of any kind of bookstore, you know, go to Hull's, go to ChristianBooks.com, go to Amazon or whatever it is, you will find book after book after book that confidently speaks about the end of the world and confidently predicting that the end of the world is going to come very soon. Whether it be on account of the color of the moons or the increased presence of Islamic fundamentalism, or something, anything really, that happens in and around Israel, or that certain leaders become leaders of certain countries, whatever it might be, it's always a signal that the end is near. What's interesting is that you will very rarely, if ever, find any books on the same passages of Scripture that are going to tell you that the world is not, in fact, coming to an end anytime soon, and that the end of the world is not, in fact, near. It's no wonder that so many of us are consumed with end times, and that we are just influenced by so much of our North American Christian culture to believe that we are living in them, that somehow we are more special than the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations that have gone before us. Now, at some point, the world is indeed going to come to an end. At some point, Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he's going to draw all of history to its conclusion. He's going to judge the quick and the dead, and he's going to usher in the new heavens and the new earth. This is a reality that's undeniable on the pages of Scripture. Yet, it is an equal reality that we are more than likely not living in the end times. So why do so many preachers try and convince us that we are? Well, one commentator uses an illustration that I think most of us will probably understand. I think it's a fairly good one. It's a dynamic that if you're a parent, you will understand even better. You've ever gone on a trip with your children could be a trip to Winnipeg, could be a trip to wherever. And on these trips, it it seems like the journey has just begun. You've just left your hometown, and immediately the kids start losing their minds in the back seat, squirming, poking each other, complaining. And the inevitable question is soon to follow. What is it? When are we going to get there? Are we there yet? And now a few hundred inquiries of this kind, and many parents start to lose their minds a little bit. And we 
one, at one point, one of the two of you are going to turn to your kids and respond by saying what? We're almost there. We're almost there. Knowing full well that you aren't even close. You just want to shut up your kids. It would be more honest for us to acknowledge to our children that, listen, we have a long journey ahead. Okay? It's going to be hours and hours and hours. And you're going to be strapped in that harness for hours and hours and hours. And we're going to stop for gas. You're going to get a chance to pee. And then back in the car. And we're just going to have to keep going. And it's going to be a boring journey that's going to take far longer than your little mind can comprehend. We're not there yet. We're not even close to being there yet. But due to our frustration and our anxiousness as parents, we would rather pretend that we're close than face the reality of what it means for us to have to deal with them for another six hours. So maybe if we tell them that we're almost there, they'll be quiet for just a short period of time. See, Daniel 8 encourages us to face the reality that we will more than likely have a long way to go before Christ comes back. There's no promise from God that He will take us out of this world to avoid troubles and tribulations. God has told us that the new world is coming, that there is a new heaven and a new earth that is going to come down to us, and we will be able to enjoy it for all of eternity. But there are no promises that that will happen anytime soon or anytime in our lifetime. And there are no promises that share with us that we can avoid the troubles and tribulations that will precede that coming. In fact, at the end of chapter 7, we read about this kingdom and this dominion, this greatness that is going to come and be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And that's a wonderful promise. But in the interim, God's people are going to need, their keep, need to keep their faith fresh. We are indeed on a long journey. And we are more than likely nowhere close to being there yet. And so how do God's people persist in faith and obedience when you live under the constant pressure of this world? When you live... When there doesn't seem to be any victory, finally, of God over evil. And every day you have to deal with the pressures of societal worldviews. The pressure of sin and temptation. And all of that stuff squeezing on you. How can God's people live as exiles and strangers, sojourners, in a land that is not theirs? And when you think about it from the readers of Daniel... They're in a similar situation, a worse one. They're in exile in Babylon under a king that didn't bring them there. And they're struggling. How can we worship God in a land that is not our own? How can we deal with what we're dealing with? And so chapter 8 is going to show them a little bit of the answer to that. And as we look at chapter 8, we can see this chapter divided very, very simply. The first 14 verses give us a vision. They give us a vision that, that Daniel shares with us of a, of, a, of a ram and a goat and a bunch of horns. And then in verses 15 to 27, we have a, a God-ordained interpretation of that vision given to Daniel through the angel Gabriel. Now, this vision involves things that are entirely in the past and fulfilled. This Daniel 8 is, is over. It's historically uh, predicted about the future in Daniel 8, but from our perspective, this is all fulfilled and gone. And so the message at times is going to sound a little bit like a history lesson. We're going to be dealing with people in, uh, in, in you know, second century uh, BC that, that we maybe heard of before and, and kingdoms that maybe we're familiar with. Uh, but it's like all history in scripture, it's given to us to provide lessons for us. And so we're going to go through the passage like we've uh, done throughout our time in Daniel and, and uh, then wrap it, kind of wrap it all up at the end with some, uh, some lessons that we can learn. So let's look at this ram and this goat. And again, what we're, we recognize immediately that there's somewhat of a similar thing going on in chapter 8 as there was in chapter 7. We're dealing with a vision of animals. But we also see 
that these animals are significantly different than the ones we saw before. The ones in chapter 7 were a hybrid of animals. They were this grotesque sort of coming together of, of unclean animals to form this one real, real evil, wicked, grotesque uh, creature that attacks God. But in chapter 8, the animals appeal, appear relatively normal. You've got a ram with horns. You've got a goat with a horn. And, and so the, the possible exception there is this one horn as opposed to the two that a goat would typically have. And so it's easier for us to associate these animals and their horns with well-known political entities. And that is exactly what Gabriel does in the interpretation. He says, this being is this, and this being is this. And so we know already from the interpretation that these animals are going to take on a specificity about them that the previous chapter didn't allow us. So Daniel's vision takes place in the third year of Belshazzar's reign. So if we want to put it this way, we're two years beyond chapter 7. So chapter 7 happened in the first year, and now we're two years beyond in Belshazzar's reign. And he finds himself in a very out-of-the-way place. Now again, is he there physically present uh, because of his duties? Don't know. Is he there because the vision drew him there? Don't really know. But he's in the city of Susa, in the province of Elam, which is an out-of-the-way place. It's actually very close to where these next kingdoms are going to arise from. And he's near the Ulai Canal. And as a result of that, he finds himself far away from the central city of Babylon, and he finds himself in what will actually be the winter home of the upcoming Persian kings. So it's not a significant place now, but it will be in just a few years' time. It was outside of the current Babylonian Empire. So that he finds himself significantly away from the political and military influence of the Babylonians. These details, I think, contribute to the fact that we're going to be privy to a vision that's much different than the previous one. So we're already being set up for something new and different. The first thing that that presents itself to Daniel is a ram. And this ram has has two horns, and it is charging. It is defeating as it runs three directions, west, north, and south. And we're told that none can stand against this charging ram. But as quickly and as easily as this ram defeats its enemies, another animal appears. A second animal interrupts this vision, and it's a goat with a noticeable horn. And this second animal takes aim directly at the ram. The the goat attacks the ram ferociously, overwhelms it, and destroys it, and in the process destroys the horns and tramples that ram underfoot. The goat has great speed, we're told. It runs without touching the ground. So this, is some, this goat is going after the ram with significant ferocity and speed. And the goat grows in power, we're told, verse 8, replacing the ram in its greatness. However... As we follow the story of the ram, or sorry, of the goat, the goat's power doesn't last very long. Uh, Perhaps very short time. There's no slow decline of its power. We're told in the text that actually this goat is cut off pretty quickly. At the pinnacle of its power, this goat suddenly finds itself destroyed. The horn is broken, it's replaced by four others. And these four others spread out in four directions. Verse 8 again. While interesting, this description of the success and struggle of the ram and the goat are simply a prelude to what is the central focus of the passage. And it centers on the small horn that grows out out of the four horns that are mentioned in the text. The horns symbolize strength and power. This small horn takes on larger proportions than all of the rest of them. It grows to the south and to the east, and we're told to the glorious land, which is, I think, Israel. And so this this kingdom, this power, stretches out, 
so that it includes everything that the ram possessed and even more. But the horn doesn't just have human dimensions to it. There's a, it touches upon the heavens, we're told in verse 10. It grows and rises and expands so that it covers a massive geographical area, but it also grows upwards, if we can use that analogy, even to the host of heaven, verse 10 tells us. And as a result, it enters into conflict with the very armies of God. And we're told, interestingly, verse 11, that the small horn achieves some measure of success against the rivals of heaven, against the armies of heaven. That not only is its success uh, limited to the defeat of the ram, but it is successful somewhat in battling the armies of heaven. And climactically, at, in verse 11, we're told that he had become so great that he is going to challenge the prince of the host. He's going to challenge the central prince of the heavenly armies. Now, significantly here, which again, we have to notice that there's a connection between what's going on on the earth and what's going on spiritually in heaven. Because notice how it's described that he takes on the prince. Okay, so let's not get into this whole, you know, Frank Peretti, this present darkness kind of idea. Because the way he attacks the host of heaven... The way he goes after the prince is talked about in very earthly terms. So if you look at verse 11 and 12, we're talking, we're talking about the regular burnt offerings. The place of the sanctuary. All of that kind of stuff is the way he attacks the prince. By going after the worship of God in his temple. He took away the daily sacrifice. Now again, we're not really sure exactly what's being referred to here. Because it could be referring to the specific sacrifices that happen every morning and every evening. It could refer to more general temple rituals. It could refer to the disruption of the entire temple structure and schedule. But what is astounding is that this little horn succeeds for at least a little while. And that not only is he attacking the temple, but he is also throwing truth to the ground. So he is attacking absolutely everything that God is and that he teaches in this life. He's standing against the temple, the sacrifices, the rituals, but he's also standing against the very truth of God himself. So this is a a pretty intense, direct attack on the things of God. Now at this point, the vision kind of stops. It it, it stops in verse 12 with this attack of the the, the horn uh, and the goat against God's people in their sacrificial worship. And it stops abruptly because we're told that, uh, about a conversation that's going on between two of the holy ones in verses 13 and 14. And they start discussing between each other, how long are these events going to last? How long is this attack going to happen on the temple? How long will truth be thrown down? How long will the structures and the schedule of the temple be destroyed? And, and the one asks the other, and then the other in verse 14 says, oh, it'll be 2,300 evening and mornings. As if we know what that means and answers the questions for us. He's told it's going to take 2,300 evening and mornings, and then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. So there's our vision. And it's no wonder in verse 15 that Daniel sought to understand it. I mean, it's a vision of animals and horns and heavenly hosts and all the rest. And so it's no wonder that Daniel has no idea what's going on. And so Daniel struggles to understand its significance. And so suddenly this this human-like figure appears before Daniel. And he hears another voice from the canal. Probably God himself. So this figure appears before him. And this voice from the canal speaks to Gabriel, the angel, and says, I want you to tell Daniel what's going on in this vision. And so Daniel then hears the meaning of what he has been watching 
in verses 17 and following. Gabriel announces the interpretation of the vision under a general heading. He says, the time of the end. The time of the end. At the end of verse 17. And later he's going to describe the scope of this vision as what shall be at the latter end of the indignation. For it appear, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Now let me just pause right there. Because in our North American minds, whenever we hear phrasing like this about the time of the end, for most of us, we run all the way to the second coming of Christ and all of those events and, and whatever. And we immediately begin to think, well, if that's the time of the end, then this chapter must be speaking about the time of the end. In short, no. And the reason why is because of the use of the phrase time of the end within Old Testament structures. Okay, it's a narrative passage. And typically when that kind of phrasing is used, it's used to speak about the immediate story at hand. The time of the end of the story. Not the time of the end, but the time of the end that's referred to in the narrative. So in other words, we have to have more in the narrative that directs us to the end than just this phrase. Do you hear what I'm saying? So the time of the end means the time of the end of this vision. So when does the vision end? That's the question. And we don't get that from the phrasing time of the end. Does that, does that make sense? So we have to be very, very careful that our minds stay in the text. Right? Stay in the chapter. And then we can go elsewhere if we need to. But we need to stay in the chapter. Alright? So we have to make sure that we're recognizing that we're dealing with something that is going to be very specific to a historical period of time. The context of these words uh, puts the climax of this vision, ultimately speaking, in the 2nd century B.C. So if we skip over to verses 20 and 22, we immediately know what this time of the end is. We immediately know what it is that, that Gabriel is speaking about when he refers to as the latter end of the indignation. Because he identifies for us that, hey, uh, the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. The goat is the king of Greece. Well, there you go. And we know full well that there's no Medo-Persian empire that exists in our day and age. We know that that empire existed in the past. We know that Greece existed in the past. And so what we're doing now is looking from our perspective, backwards, from Daniel's perspective, forwards, and then we meet in the middle, where we're supposed to meet. And so the nice thing about chapter 8 is, if you're reading the uh, commentaries on Daniel, you'll get some argument in chapter 7, you'll get a whole boatload of argument in chapter 9, but in chapter 8, everybody kind of understands what's going on, because Gabriel is nice enough to tell us who's being referred to. And so Gabriel interprets this animal symbolism in a way in which we can understand specific kings to be part of this vision. And ultimately speaking, the little horn, we can identify with Antiochus IV Epiphanes. More about him later. So Gabriel interprets the animal symbolism given earlier in the chapter in a very precise manner. Again, chapter 7, we've got these grotesque beasts, and they're just said to be four kingdoms. And here, they're identified with specific and what will become well-known political enemies. The ram with the two horns is Media and Persia. And in the vision itself, one horn is going to grow larger than the other, which I think is a sure reference to the fact that in the Media persian Empire, the Persians would eventually become the dominant group in that empire and would soon swallow up the Medes. So again, Media and persian Empire swallowed up by the bigger horn. The goat with the single horn that speedily devastated the ram is Greece. And the single horn, I think, is surely its first king, Alexander the Great. Now, if you don't know anything about history at this point, Alexander the Great 
was the great. He truly was. He became king in his early 20s. He died at 33. And in the 10 years between, conquered basically everything. He made his way all the way to India in the east. And there was a story told, a time in which he stood and looked over his empire. And he wept because there was no other empires to conquer. And he did it quickly. Ten years to conquer all that stuff for a guy in his 20s. That's pretty amazing. That, it definitely does fulfill this goat running without touching the ground. Now behind him, he had two sons. Alexander and Hercules. Now these boys were small when Alexander died at 33 in 323 BC. And so they were ultimately murdered. And this massive empire that Alexander the Great uh, had won was divided up into four pieces among his four generals. And these, no doubt, are the four prominent horns. So we have a prominent horn, that, that, uh, this goat that runs, defeats the entire world. He runs swiftly without touching the ground. And then he is, his demise comes almost immediately. That's exactly what happened. Alexander the Great went to a party. Must have been a good one because he died the next day. Didn't die in battle, no blaze of glory. Just died because it was one heck of a night. And then his, four, and then his two sons are murdered. The four generals come in. Those are the four horns. So we're, we're still pretty much within the context of history and this text. Then the vision skips about two centuries and these, this, this skipping of history is going to be detailed later in the book of Daniel in chapter 11. So we're going to get a little bit of insight there. But for now, in this vision, the, the focus is immediately going to one particular horn. One particular horn that's going to come out of these four kingdoms. And scholars almost universally agree that the horn that grew out of the one is the second century Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now we know a lot about this guy because he was not very nice to God's people. We know a lot about him from inter intertestamental writings. So you've heard of the book of Maccabees. The book of Maccabees is all about how the Jews responded to this king. So from, from intertestamental writing like that as well as uh, other historical records of that time. We know a lot about that guy. We know that he started out really small. That he was actually a relatively insignificant figure who became big in the kingdom. In fact, uh, he was not actually to be in line for the throne. He had an older brother who should have taken the throne. And through political manipulation, a little bit of poisoning here, a little bit of murder over there, a little bit of influencing someone over there, eventually he becomes the king. Not only over his older brother, but over a few cousins that probably should have been king ahead of him. So he finds himself through manipulation to become this king, which we read about again in verse 23. A king of bold face who understands riddles shall rise. And he managed to push his nephew out and gain the throne. And he became a great military leader. He pushed his influence all the way into Egypt as well as into Persia. All the way into Armenia and Parthia. All, all the while dominating and oppressing Palestine. And Antiochus IV indeed established himself as a transgressor and a king of bold face. There was an incident that is being referred to in this text where Antiochus massed his army and he went to Egypt to conquer Egypt. But he was frustrated in that. It didn't work. He got turned back. And so he was so angry at not being able to, to, to overcome the Egyptians that he turned his anger against the, the Jews in Israel and in Palestine. And he sought to basically do whatever he could to anger them. To intrude upon and disrupt the Jewish religion. And it stood in his policy of Hellenization. He wanted everyone to become Greeks. 
And so these Jewish people who continued to practice at the temple, who continued to sacrifice to their own God, stood in the way of that. And so in 167 BC, on his way back from Egypt, he ordered the cessation of temple sacrifices. He attacked the ritual and the schedule. And not only that, but he profaned the temple by introducing a holy object sacred to the god of Zeus. So he went into the most intimate parts of the temple and he took away all of the holy objects that the Jews used in their worship and he set up a, an object of worship to Zeus. And then on the altar of the Jews, he sacrificed a pig to that object, all of which is abhorrent to Jewish religion. And this holy object became such an abhorrence to them that in Jewish religion they referred to it as the abomination that causes desolation. They referred to that object that was brought in there as the abomination that causes desolation. Now, hold that thought in your mind. We'll return to it in chapter 9. And hold that thought as well because it will be referred to later on in Revelation as well. And so Antiochus is essentially destroying all of the things that we were just told about in, in the first half of chapter 8. He's going after the burnt offerings. He's throwing truth to the ground. He is destroying the place of the sanctuary and all of those kinds of things. Gross sacrilege. And in fact, there's no real description that we can that we can make that would be reflective of the way the Jewish people would have thought about what Antiochus was doing. And this led to what's called the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, the Maccabees, Maccabee is a family name, and he had, I believe, four sons that led a revolt of the Jewish people against Antiochus in Palestine from the years 167 to 160. And in the middle of that, Antiochus is going to die. And after a lengthy struggle with the forces of Antiochus, they would eventually drive the Seleucid king out of Judah, and they would retake the temple, and they would cleanse it and rededicate it in 164 BC. Now such actions against the worship of of God's people was far more than an affront to God's people. Again, we're told in this text that this particular individual is going to not only expand his kingdom, but he's going to attack God himself by attacking the temple of God's people. And so we see Antiochus doing exactly that. He's going to stand against the prince of the host. He's going to stand against God himself. But we know that such arrogance can only lead to one conclusion, and that's utter defeat. Verse 25 brings us that. We're told, by his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken. Which is exactly what happened. Antiochus died in somewhat obscure, obscure circumstances in a campaign way off in the east, and then that was it. But we're told that this defeat, this Maccabean revolt, the death of Antiochus was not something that was simply done by human hands. This was done by God himself. The ultimate power behind these Maccabean freedom fighters was God himself. God gave them the victory. God allowed them to restore the temple. God allowed them to restore it, bring it to its former function, and become once again the center for worship of the true God. And so finally, the angelic interpreter affirms the time frame of the suffering and its end. We're told, verse 26... The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given to you is true. But seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. Interestingly enough, uh, we can't be dogmatic about the meaning of these 2,300 evenings and mornings. Uh, I'll save you the details, but 
there's two possible ways we could understand this reference. Uh, is it 2,300 days that are being referred to here? 2,300 evenings and mornings of sacrifice? Or are we talking about evening and morning sacrifices, which would be a significantly less number of days? Right? So if you have, evening and, if you have 2,300 morning and evening sacrifices, you only have 1,150 days. I'm bad at math, but I think that's right. But if the 2,300 morning and evenings refer to a day, you've got 2,300 days. And either one of those interpretations fits the context. So no matter what, it's possible to fit those numbers within the timeline of the fulfillment of the middle of the second century. We don't know exactly when this period started either. I think that's one of the dangers that we have when, you, when we come across numbers in apocalyptic literature. Is that when do they start and when do they end? Do, do these 2300 days start with the prohibition of sacrifice in 167 or do they start with the removal of the high priest in 171 now you didn't know any of this when you came here this morning but how do you calculate the days does it calculate when when Antiochus marched into the temple or did it start four years earlier when Antiochus took Ananias the third and said you're no longer the high priest and effectively stopped the sacrifices so which one and when does it end? Does it end with the reconstruction of the high priesthood so that the sacrifices can come again? Or does it end a few years later with the death of Antiochus? So we can just turn our brains in knots if we're trying to think about these numbers as actually being literally significant. But thankfully, they're not. There's a better way to think about numbers in apocalyptic literature. And so I think it's a good time for us to have a little talk about that. Now, last week, we talked about how to interpret apocalyptic literature. And we talked about hermeneutics. Do you remember that word? Do you remember that word? Okay, it's the way in which you approach a text so that you can interpret it according to its genre. Okay? And so when we're talking about hermeneutics, how to approach a text, when we are dealing with an apocalyptic text, the reality is, is that the symbols and metaphors and pictures that appear include the numbers that are laid down. Okay, so in chapter 7, we were introduced to the phrase, a time, times, and half a time. Now immediately for many of us who, who've been wrapped up in a certain understanding of revelation and stuff, we immediately think, three and a half years. But that's not what it says. It says time, one time, times, plural, which could mean two, but plural could mean a lot more than two, and then half a time. So you have to have a reason to think three and a half years out of time, times, and half a time. And even then, three and a half years might be symbolic in itself. And in chapter 9, we're going to get to this beautifully infamous idea of 70 weeks. And in chapter 12, we're going to read this enigmatic statement that the time between the abolishment of the sacrifice and the setting up of the abomination of desolation will be 1,290 days. Followed by an even more enigmatic statement, Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. It's all enough to make your head spin, right? Right? It's all enough to make you get out your calculator and try and figure out, well, if this king was born here and this king was born there and this happened here, then we add these days and that's this much. Uh, just trust me, you don't have to do that. And the reason why is because the purpose of numbers in apocalyptic is not for date setting, but it's for the comfort of God's people. They remind us that the trouble and the trials of God's people are always limited. They're always relatively short. Remember, remember what we're told about God in chapter 7? When he sits on his white throne, he's what? The ancient of days. He's the everlasting. He's the eternal. He's the infinite. And so when the ancient of days comes and says, Oh, guess what? 2,300 evening and mornings. 
He's thinking, listen, I'm the Ancient of Days, and I'm limiting this to that long. So have faith. Have trust that I am in charge and that I am well beyond those days and that you can believe that I'm in control and be encouraged by the limiting of those days by me. And so these numbers are given not so that we can read in in Daniel chapter 8 and compute when it would that Antiochus' four epiphanies would be stopped. It was recorded to assure the people of God that he had things under control. The number indicates with certainty that there would be a beginning point of the struggles that Antiochus is going to bring, but that those were limited by God, and there would be a stopping point of the persecution, even if that number can't be computed in detail, according to the calendar as we know it, and the calendar as they know it, what we do know is that God is going to limit the time. And so at the end of this, Daniel probably feels like many of you do. He was overcome and lay sick for some days. I think that's probably going to be a theme here for the next number of months when we look at the rest of Daniel and Revelation. I have no idea what Jared just said. I feel sick. It's time for Metashlof. I'm laying down. Now think about it. Daniel had the interpretation of Gabriel given to him, and he didn't, under, he didn't quite figure it out. He didn't quite figure it out. But notice at the end of verse 27, he then rose and went back about the king's business. So he struggled with it, he battled with it, he didn't maybe understand all of it, but then he was driven to continue to obey, and he was appalled by the vision and didn't understand it. Now again, keep in mind what Daniel's dealing with. Daniel's living in the 6th century BC. He's living in the 500s. And he receives a vision about Media, Persia, and Greece. Now from Daniel's perspective, Media, Persia, and Greece were nothing. Like they were were literally small little kingdoms. The kingdom might even be too big a word. They were small little city-states with significantly less influence than the kingdom of which he was a part of. And to now be told that Media and Persia would run like a ram all over. And that this goat, this grease, would arise and crush them too. It's all all crazy. And so Daniel is still struggling with how he can deal with this. And he's appalled by the vision and he did not understand it. So can we understand it? Is there a way for us... To look back on this and to see and to realize that we've got one chapter of Daniel with a prophecy and a fulfillment all within it. And a prophecy and fulfillment that is 2,300 years ago for us. Can we just sort of say, oh, that's interesting. God's prophecies happen and praise the Lord. It demonstrates that God's word is true and that God exists and that's wonderful. And then just kind of move on to chapter 9 because that's really the chapter we care about in Daniel anyway, right? (laughs) Well, I think there's a few things that this does communicate to us. Because like Paul says, this stuff is written to help us, to, to, to allow us to see God in his fullness. And so I just want to highlight three things for us that we can be challenged and encouraged with from this passage. The first one is an encouragement that nothing will thwart the plans of God. Nothing will ever thwart God's plan. We know that there is conflict that exists in in this world, right? There's conflict that exists between human powers and between people and on, on big levels and little levels. But we know from a text like this that that is simply a reflection of a cosmic spiritual war that exists beyond the human conflict, now, we're, don't go about trying to identify what are the angels and demons doing above us. Okay, that, that's just a question the Bible doesn't answer. And so we just say, Frank Peretti, thank you for your books. Don't read them, okay? Um, okay, if you have read... Sorry, Rose. If you have read them, it's okay. But let's not make that kind of stuff theology. Because it's very easy for us in our North American culture with highly spiritualized way of thinking that that we can understand what it means for Antiochus 
to go after the Prince of Hosts. And we don't. But what we do know is that when we look back on the history articulated in chapter 8, any affront of a leader or a person against the people of God is an attack upon God himself, and God will rise up to defend his people. Doesn't that encourage you? Right? When Jesus says that the gates of hell will not stand up against my church, that's basically what he's kind of saying. Is that when the devil asks for you, God will say, absolutely not. He's mine. She is mine. You can't have her. I have plans for her. I have plans for him. When the devil stands up against God's people, God says, absolutely not. I sent my son to redeem those people. They are firmly within his grasp. And you cannot have access to them beyond anything that I will allow. And so anyone in Antiochus' time or in our time who stands up against us, who stands up against God's people, will always be defeated by God himself. He has plans for us. He has plans to redeem us, to glorify us, to complete his sanctification within us. And in that plan, God always wins. God always wins. So no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what you're struggling with, temptation, persecution, the the struggle and battle every day with sin, or the struggle and battle with somebody who's oppressing you, know this, that God is always fighting on your behalf. He has saved you, He is going to sanctify you, and He will glorify you, and nothing will prevent Him from succeeding in those plans. Isn't that amazing? God always wins. It may not seem like it right now, right? I mean, many of us have had these moments where we're just like, okay, Lord, I have no idea what in the world you're doing right now because it sure feels like I am being beaten up. But even in those moments, we know that God is working to his ends in our moments of struggle. He wins in the moments of history and he wins in the end. Let's never forget that. Like, let's not just look at the end and say, oh, God wins over there. Let's look at the moments of our life and say, God is winning now. And that's got to be an incredible encouragement for each one of us and for the church as we deal with more and more and more of the evil one's oppression. The second thing I think we need to be encouraged by in this text is that this prophecy and its fulfillment is a bit of a historical lesson of an even greater reality. This act of rebellion and defilement against God, this desecration of the temple brought about by Antiochus, this desire to displace the religion of God's people, to throw truth down, and to, and to destroy the people of God, was a terrible thing. But nearly 200 years after Antiochus is dead and gone, God's son, Emmanuel, God with us, would be rebelled against, defiled, desecrated, and killed on account of the rebellion of all of mankind, you and I included. The cross is surely the ultimate expression of the rebellion of Satan against God. It is the ultimate attack of Satan on the prince of the hosts. It is the ultimate attack act of enmity of the kingdoms of the world against God. And yet even in this ultimate of evils, God's plan could not be thwarted. God's plan to redeem his people is not only not thwarted, it's actually fulfilled. He will redeem his people. At the cross, Satan did his absolute worst to Jesus. And yet in his death, Jesus defeated sin and Satan and death. And so the cross and the empty tomb are the place where God gives his final answer to human rebellion and transgression. And it's the place where he binds and defeats Satan. The cross is therefore the guarantee that God's plan will always prevail in the face of our weakness in the face of rebellion, and in the face of sin, and no matter what the opposition that you experience in this life, when you look at the cross, you see the victory of God. 
See, that's the tangible nature of what we just did. Is that when you are struggling with sin, and when you're struggling with how God's victory can be applied, you don't look forward, you look back. You don't look at your own moment of conversion or whatever. No, you've got to look further back to a cross and to a tomb that is empty. And as a result of that, the victory is won. The victory doesn't wait. The victory is won. This evil one is bound and you are guaranteed your salvation on account of his victory. And evil remains powerful in this world. And it can never overcome us. Because of that empty tomb and the cross. It can never overpower us. Because the blood has been shed. And the promises in Christ have been fulfilled. Our path to glorification may lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. But we know. We know that our shepherd leads us through. And that he has died to save us from it. Third thing. We must not be obsessed with end times, but we must be obsessed with living a life of obedience as we wait for Christ's return. Let me just quote the words of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark. He says this, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge uh, with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. Sit, uh, sit the evening or, or, at mid, or sorry, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Stay awake. That's the practical implication of Daniel chapter 8. Every generation sees, quote unquote, the signs of the times. This is why uh, we are tempted, I think, particularly today, uh, to not listen to Jesus' words. uh, To think that we are living in the precise time. And to make preparations for when the time is coming rather than spiritual preparations. Right? So here's what needs to happen in our lives. Whenever you hear of wars or rumors of wars. Whenever you hear of an earthquake. Whenever you hear of a government opposing Christ from its seat of power. Or whenever you hear of a certain particular person who specifically opposes Christ. You're not supposed to say the end is coming. It's coming. It's our generation. We're almost there. No. You're supposed to remind yourself that nobody knows. And that every generation has had wars and rumors of wars. Every generation has had earthquakes. Every generation has had kings opposing God. Every generation has had individuals who are the Antichrist. Every generation has had all this kind of stuff. And the message that Jesus gives to us is stay awake, be prepared. Don't guess at the coming of Christ. Don't think of yourself as the end times generation. Think of yourselves as one who waits faithfully for either your death or the return of Christ. Make preparations. Be faithful. Be obedient. Trust in Christ alone. Give thanks daily for the cross. Live a life of repentance and faith. And place the victory that Christ won over sin at the center of your life. And know that as a result of that, sin and evil can never come against us, no matter how long we have to wait. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the encouragement that comes from this chapter. The encouragement that nothing can thwart your plans. That in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have guaranteed the protection of your people You've guaranteed the victory over sin that we so desperately need. And so, Lord, I pray that each one of us would stay awake. That we wouldn't be obsessed with timelines and and with what's going on in the news. But, Lord, that we would be obsessed with being faithful to you moment by moment. 
so that if you come back, when you come back, whether it's in our lifetime or not, that we would be ready, that we would be ready to meet you each and every day, whether you come back or whether you take us to yourself. And Lord, I pray that as we do that, that it would be a witness to those around us. Lord, that we would not just be a witness by the way we live, but be a witness with the words that we say, so that people around us can, can hear and see the gospel being preached, so that when you come back again, or if you take them beforehand, that they will be ready to meet you as well. So we pray, Lord, that through the faithfulness of your people, that you would grow your kingdom and glorify your name. Amen.